morning ladies and gentlemen let's welcome us uh, to the age of exploration here this is where we started discovering new lands and new worlds and making money for the old world in search of the four G's God glory gold and gains so these are the objectives we want you to take away from this we're gonna mention uh, about six European explorers that were out discovering new lands explain why they wanted to discover them look at the contrast uh, compare and contrast the social and cultural impacts on Europe Africa Asia and the Americas because it the world did not stay the same after these uh, new uh, these different cultures met we're gonna talk about the Columbian exchange uh, it's one that you'll cover again in uh, the Columbian triangle exchange you'll uh, talk about them again in US history and what were the impacts of these, both positive and negative? We'll look at some of the products that were traded. You'll do a little worksheet in class. And we're going to look at the um, the geographic expansion in the Americas, Africa and Asia, and who owned what after all this was over. So the Columbian Exchange is named after Christopher Columbus because he was the first one to kind of come over. He landed in this area, the uh, right in here, Dominican Republic, Hispaniola and several others have found these different places and things they started bringing back goods to Europe you know corn tomatoes potatoes you can read them here uh, vanilla beans that were down in here in Central America uh, chocolate from the Aztecs pineapples tobacco from the Americas uh, peppers yeah they didn't have peppers in Europe they came from here sweet potatoes even though Europeans don't like sweet potatoes now <laughs> they liked them then turkeys those types of things went back to Europe well here's what Europe brought to the Americas because you know, when you go somewhere you want to kind of eat your own stuff they brought lots of animals horses pigs sheep and cattle you know, cows lots of grains some fruits uh, coffee beans uh, from Arabica that they had gotten from uh, the the uh, trade with um, other countries uh, via the Silk Road olives and onions they brought those to the Americas uh, and introduced them and we have all those today so just think when you eat a meal where you where you ate today is not necessarily was originally from here you know honeybees came were not original here sugar cane uh, bananas grapes all these are, are new to the area from them but they also brought disease smallpox influenza that's the, just a regular flu Typhus, measles, malaria, diphtheria, whooping cough. All of these had killed people in the dark ages in Europe. It still lingered, but everybody was immune to them. But here, the Native Americans weren't immune, and it killed large populations of them. But it was a huge cultural impact, both from the plants to the animals to the human population. You know, now you got a lot of Europeans over here. Um, and of course all these foods and whatnot and they took Europeans back or excuse me they took Native Americans back to Europe as well to show off to introduce to the new world to learn the language and then to come back over here and as we mentioned they uh, a lot of different cultural products changed European lifestyles a lot of potatoes corn tobacco it changed just the way everyday people ate and uh, started living in Europe and the Europeans brought horses and cattle here, uh, which changed the everyday lives of the Native Americans, the you know the first peoples as we like to call them, or the Native Americans. However, the diseases that were brought killed about half the Native American population, so it was not good for them. But considering that, if or if you think about it, probably half the population of Europe was killed during the Middle Ages because of those same diseases. Uh, now those those same peoples are immune to them. So here was the impact of the Columbian Exchange. Uh, the diseases killed many Native Americans. We talked about that. They're growing crops here in the, in the new in the new world, but they have you have to have labor. You have to have workers to manage these fields. So you have to have a shortage. You ha they wound up with a shortage of labor to grow the crops, which led them to use African slaves. And slavery was based on race. They got them. They bought them or traded for them from West Africa. We'll talk about that later. They would bring goods down here, buy the slaves or trade for the slaves, and then bring the goods over to uh, the Americas. And the plantation system, you'll see some, some folks here working on the plantation system. 
they would uh, it just destroyed the local economies and the environment because they weren't back then they weren't environmentally aware of how things worked they didn't understand that you had to maintain your your land you had to protect it for future use they were worried about money here and now so those are the impacts of the Columbian Exchange the triangle trade developed later the Columbian Exchange was just between Europe and the in the New World Europe and the New World that's Columbian Exchange triangular trade came about later between the New World mainly Britain they would go down, but Spain would do it too. They would bring things to West Africa, like firearms, cloth, salt, things to the West African um, kings and warlords. They would set up trading posts here, and they would trade those for slaves to bring to the New World to work on the farms, where they would then make raw goods, and then they would bring those back to Britain. So they would take the the firearms, the cloth, the salt, and other goods to West Africa, trade them for slaves. Trades would be bought to the West. Slaves would, would be brought back to the West Indies and who would then work on plantations, growing sugar, making rum, and that would be, be then transported to Britain to be sold to buy more firearms, cloth, salt, and just the triangle trade kept going. You can see why it's called a triangle. You've got the three legs there. And so it would be textiles and rum. Whoop. Textiles and rum, slaves, sugar and cotton. They would just trade whatever they could get, bringing raw goods back. So it's basically the first steps of mercantilism. So the four motivating factors. One was the support for the diffusion of Christianity. They want to spread Christianity. And that's the second was political and economic competition between countries. Spain would Spain France, England, they all didn't like each other, so they wanted to have more money to build bigger armies, to make themselves richer, to make the kingdoms richer, to buy more ships, to conquer and find more lands. And there was an increasing demand in Europe for gold, spices, and natural resources, uh, be that sugar, be that tobacco, whatever that is, more people... The more money people made in Europe, the more they wanted to buy things. The quality of life went up. The more they wanted to buy, the more slaves they had to trade for to make more plantations, to grow more stuff, to bring it back to Europe. In fact, they were gaining knowledge from Muslim maps that allowed for more explanation or exploration. The Muslims had been sailing up and down Africa from the Songhai Empire and made a lot of good maps in that area and in and around the Indian Ocean. So they were; those ideas were being traded on the trade routes, and the Europeans were learning from them. So these are the four G's that we talk about. There was the first one was support for diffusion. That's God. Political and economic competition. That's glory. I'm, people will always remember my name. And if you look today, we're going to talk about six explorers. They have glory. They're always going to be in history because they're the ones who started this. Demand for gold and spices. That's gold or just money. It's kind of a one one term catches all. And gain. They were looking for new knowledge, new truths, new lands. They were trying to explore and gain more information. And just gain anything you could gain and fill in the blank. So now let's talk about some of these explorers and who they were and what they did and why we're studying them. You'll need to know all of these. You'll need to know the country they're from and what they did. All right, so let's talk about Portugal. Portugal is a little small country here um, on the Iberian Peninsula, which is all of Spain and Portugal. This little peninsula here, this is France. And this is all Spain. This is Portugal. So they had a couple of people we want to talk about. The first one is Prince Henry the Navigator, and that's a painting of him. This is one of the ancient Muslim maps that he was using to help. But what he did was he wasn't an explorer himself. Um, a big one but what he did was he started a school and trained explorers much like we do here I mean we we it's like a certification school just like you would start a school to train mechanics or air conditioner people or carpenters he did the same thing so you can see a, a painting of a school here he teach him how to use maps they're using a compass to measure distance he would teach him how to navigate and these are students and this is him in the painting but he was providing them with new technologies, new ideas to help them go find places. 
So the next one we're going to talk about, Portuguese here, is Bartolomeu Diaz. Portuguese explorer. He was the first one. He took off. And he landed down here in Cape Verde, down here in the Benin Islands, over here in the Congo, came down here, found different places. But he was the first one to go around the southern point of Africa uh, and find it. I mean, everybody knew it. it had to end at some point. But he was the first one to say, okay, yep, here's where it is. And we're going to turn around and come back home and tell everybody what we found. Didn't know what laid out here, but he was the first one to round uh the southern tip of Africa, the southern point, now called the Cape of Good Hope. This is all South Africa here. And they began to colonize that. He wanted to both colonize and grow uh, Asia. He just wanted to find it. You know, how do you get there going this way around this big landmass? So that's what he did. He found that in 1488. And then Vasco da Gama, he's from Portugal. Ten years later, he landed, he kept going around the Cape of Good Hope, the southern point of Africa, and he landed in 1498. So he was the first one to find the first direct trade route from Europe to India um, and the East Indies, that's the other islands out there, by sea or the maritime route. So now they can sail around Africa, get to the East Indies, carry back more cargo that they now control a lot faster than the Silk Road. So about here is really when the Silk Road um, starts just to, its decline. So here's what he did. He started off in Lisbon in 1497, came down to Cape Verde Islands, swooshed way out here, St. Helena Bay. This is all the Cape of Good Hope. It was named and he got there, kept going around Mozambique, Mombasa, and finally landed over here in Calcutta in 1498, went to Goa in India, and then he returned. So he stayed there a few months. And that's in the summer, dude. That had to be hot. That had to be really hot. And then he comes back down. He comes along the coast of Africa and finally sails back up to the Azores and comes home. To, so it took him over two years to do that. But he wasn't in a hurry either. So that was that was fine. But uh, he came back and reported, yep, I found this thing. It's too easy. We just sail around and off you go. The, that way you can take more ships next time and bring back more goods. So Basco da Gama. First one to sail all the way around to India by maritime route, and then he can share that information and sell it with others. Now let's go to España, Spain. Uh, that's the bigger island or the bigger country on the Iberian Peninsula, right next to Portugal. Now they created a rigid class system wherever they went, and they dictated Latin rule in America, or or and had dictatorial rule in Latin America. They instituted uh, cultures, their own cultures from Spain into their colonies. So they had the Pincelaries. They were um, the aristocrats. They were Spanish. They were from the peninsula. They were the rich people, the nobles. Then you had the descendants of the Pincelaries, the people who were the Creoles. They were born there, but they weren't mixed with the people. Mestizos were a mix of Caucasian and Indian. Because people will be people. The mulattoes were a mix of the Caucasians and the Africans, the, the slaves that they brought over. Then you had the Native American Indians from the island, the natives. And then you had the African slaves that were at the bottom of the totem pole. They were the lowest class of so the Pincelaries, Pincelares, excuse me. That was the highest class because they were the Spanish aristocrats. But does that remind you of anything? Any class that you, once you were born into it you couldn't get out of it maybe the Hindu social classes it's very similar to that so let's talk about the first Spanish explorer we're going to talk about and it's Christopher Columbus he is actually an Italian but he went to Prince Isabel and King Ferdinand and asked told him what his idea was and they decided to fund him so he wanted to sail west to find a uh, route to India. Remember uh, Vasco da Gama and uh, Vasco da Gama hadn't sailed yet, but uh, Diaz had. He said I, if they hadn't found it yet, so he's out trying to find it. So he left in 1492 and he discovered the Caribbean, uh, Cuba, Hispaniola, and Central America, Honduras, Nicaragua. 
Um, he thought he ran into Asia, but he did. Um, similar skin color, but it didn't. It wasn't the same people yet. But he didn't know it was not there. He made four trips, uh, but he enslaved, tortured, and brought disease to the natives. So he was not a good guy. He was looking for the four Gs. You see the bottom picture down here. Here he is um, claiming the land for Spain. And he is also has a priest with him looking at the Native Americans, blessing them, and blessing the new land for Spain and God. So he went in 1492, landed in here. He came back. He had four voyages altogether. He went back arrested on the last one because he didn't... Um, he wasn't treating his crew very well, so they mutinied and took him back to Spain. But as you can see, he never landed in North America. He was always in the islands. Two Spanish conquistadors, uh, Hernan Cortez and Francisco Pizarro. So here's Cortez. He conquers. He comes over. In 1519, he stays a long time. You can see what he does here. 1519, he conquers Veracruz, um, Santiago, Cuba. He lands. He meets the Aztecs here at their capital. He destroys them, conquers them, gets a, gets a lot of their uh, um, enemies to help. He destroys them, and he comes down here into Honduras, into Central America, uh, for another two years and does about the same. He names himself uh, governor of those islands. He's appointed that. He conquers Honduras in 1524. And he he has done, he conquered and found a lot of things in there, like especially silver mines. And then Cortez, he conquers, he, he lands over in this area. He trucks across the mountains and the jungles through here finds local peoples steals from them and eventually finds the Incas meets them and winds up killing them either be either, either by disease or just by using technology um, his you know the armor the weapon the guns the sword the metal swords so how did they win how did these two Cortez and uh, Pizarro win well, they had technology. They had horses that they could ride and they provide shock um, and be faster than the people running. They had armor that could deflect spears and anything that the natives had, clubs. They had guns. They had cannons. They could kill people from a long range. So they were better equipped for war. They also had disease. It wiped out about half the native population. Uh, they also got other native tribes to help Cortez fight. Uh, Cor the Aztecs had a lot of enemies. And Cortez is like, okay, hey, fine, we'll just get the enemies to help him make them stronger because he didn't have but, uh, oh, I forgot the number. It was, it was very small numbers. It was 180 or 600. Well, Cortez had either 180 or 600, and Pizarro had the other number, whichever one it was. But you can tell that's not a lot of men to be conquering empires. But when you have disease on your side, that helps. Another Spaniard was Ferdinand Magellan. Now, he's an interesting story, and it's kind of misnamed for um, around the uh, in historical circles among the people. His crew, he explored for Spain, and he thought he would try to sail around the world, see what this, you know, where all he could find. So his crew made the first round the world voyage. In other words, they circumnavigated, circum circumference is the outside of a circle, and navigate is to means to travel. And guided travel. So he guided traveled around the world. That's what circumnavigate means. And it took from 1519 to 1522. But it proved that it proved that the world was round. He took off one way and came back from another direction. But we purposely said his crew was the first to make the rich trip because he was killed in the Philippines. He didn't make it home. His body was buried there. Uh, it was only one of his five ships made it back. And out of 237 sailors that left, only 18 came back. So those 18 were actually the first people to, sail, to circumnavigate the world, not him. But it was his crew. So what he did, took off from Hispania, sailed around. These, this area down here at the southern point of South America is called the Straits of Magellan because he was the first to go around them. So he comes back, gets into the Philippines, which is right here. Gets killed in a battle. 
and then they come down through here sail southern routes along the Antarctic Ocean around the uh, Cape of Good Hope which he's heard about because of uh, Diaz and Vasco da Gama comes back up the coast of Africa and back home to Spain well he didn't his crew did he was killed right here but it took about three years and of course they were hailed as heroes and they actually proved that the world was round because but before that people thought the world was flat let's look at an English explorer here you see England there on the map Sir Francis Drake uh, he was a British explorer and a pirate he was also sent out he was sent out to find new lands travel and do whatever he could raid capture Spanish or Portuguese um, vessels take their wealth uh, it was paid for by clean by Queen Elizabeth the first you've heard of her but a lot of what he did and what he found is was the basis for the future British Empire uh, but Francis Drake was also the uh, and who was, he was the second person or the second group but he was the first big name explorer he took off from England sailed around Straits of Magellan up south South America into Mexico Drake's Bay is out in Seattle so hitting that coming around through Hawaii into the Philippines through all here and then back around same as Magellan's crew but he lived the whole trip took three years again but you can see there there's Drake but Drake was the second person to rap you get it Drake the rapper around the world yeah. sort of funny and here's his map again 1579 oh, where are we takes off 1578 around comes up to, to North America says okay well this is not England because <laughs> he cut you know <laughs> not England comes out keeps going and a lot of the same route that Magellan's crew took back home in France they have one we're going to talk about and that is Jacques Cartier Cartier he was a French explorer he came up and went through the St. Lawrence River which is right here into what is currently Quebec three rivers Montreal and into Lake Ontario so he was able to sail all that he crawled up because some points in there are not uh, exactly the, the best for, for big ships so he had to make smaller things make smaller vessels go the whole way up through here just to see what it was like because he was trying to look for a passage around the north side of the new world to get to Asia uh, they didn't find it till much much later but uh, he he took uh, actually three trips to the Americas doing that. So what did this do? This new expansion of European empires into the Americas. How did it affect you know the Americas, Africa, and Asia? Well, in the Americas, Spain, Britain, Portugal, and France expanded. They all had uh, new lands. Spain took most of what is today Mexico, Central America, and lots of. Uh, South America, the British took North, uh, a lot of North America, especially the East Coast. Portugal took what is currently Brazil. And the French expanded into the Americas up into what's now Canada and west of uh, the Mississippi. In Africa, the expansion, it was expansion of trade, gold, slaves, and other resources from Africa and resources into them. Um, and the Europeans set up trading posts along the coast. So they would just go there, buy whatever they needed, the ships would land download the traded goods get the others you know the slaves and put them on the boats and send them off then you had colonization in Asia by small groups of merchants they would you know they didn't establish colonies but they would establish trading companies like the East India Company that you'll learn about in US history but they would just set up, set up against small bases buy goods from the governments who would get it from the merchants and then they would bring their ships in upload the ships and be done with it and then take off back back to uh, whatever the home country was a lot of gold and silver were exported back uh, to Europe and Asia the the empires in the Americas the Aztecs the Incas they disappeared they declined destroyed by disease or war or enslavement uh, but the Europeans basically destroyed all that local culture 
Spain imported a lot of silver into the market. Silver went into Asia, and they wanted more so silver more than gold. And Spain found a way to extract silver in the mountains of uh, Mexico and South America. But it increased competition for European powers to gain more land. So as one country gets more, another country wants more. So you can see down here who got what. This is what France had. England had the purple. Spain had all the gold area or yellow area, what do you want to call it. And Portuguese, Portugal had this red area. So this, uh, as mentioned, this increased competition eventually led to the demise of the Aztecs and Incan empires. They went away. North America and Central America were split up. The Africans were forced to migrate. They had no choice. They were enslaved by people within Africa, sold as property to the European traders, and then any, any native peoples in the Americas had their religion converted to Catholicism by the Spanish or the Portuguese. Your plantation system, as mentioned, destroyed the Americas' economies, the native economies, and damaged their environment. Uh, they weren't worried about, the Europeans weren't worried about owning it or making it better. They were worried about what wealth it could bring them, and only for the here and now. That's all they were worried about, because they would, they would find something else later once they had abused this. Uh, they would find something later to uh, replace it. So where are some of the culture diffusions? Uh, well, the colonies imitated the culture and social patterns of their parent country. They brought from Spain, Portugal, France, or Britain their way of doing life and imposed it upon everybody else. Uh, the Catholics brought their faith, language, and cultures to the new land and made it uh, made the other people those. So in Africa, it was, it was an expansion of the slave trade. It kept growing. Uh, families were destroyed because of this. They introduced firearms to African society, which allowed for more slave trade because now the people who were selling the slaves had firearms and could go capture other tribes to sell them to get more more goods and become wealthy and more powerful. And a lot of the fittest members of the of the African society were lost to the slave trade. Weak weak people were not um, traded as slaves. Weaker women weren't traded as slaves or yeah they only the Europeans only wanted to buy the strong ones to who could go and work and have more and stronger women to, or younger women to go and work and have children so they could have more slaves in the future in Asia European influence was not welcome Your Asians didn't want them mingling they didn't want them bringing their religion or anything else they were fine with the money but they said that's why they set up those Restrictions of setting up the the trade centers where they would just have a big building. The farmers would bring things in. The government would buy them from the farmer. Then the government would sell them to the Europeans so that the people of that country and the Europeans would never meet. So in summary, it all started with really the Colombian exchange. It benefited Europe and the Americas, but it had bad impacts on the Americas. The triangle trade was expansion of the Colombian trade, but involved slave trade. That would come that, that would come later. All these explorers were sent to find new worlds and new ways to trade. The four G's. God, gold, glory, and gain. New navigation, new navigation instruments helped with exploration. Uh, as they were able to do that. And new trade open resulted in wealth in Europe, but exploited and ruled and ruined civilizations in Africa and the Americas. So I hope that gives you a little bit of detail of how we got here, where we are today, uh, for good and for bad. It wasn't uh, wasn't always the best for everybody, but that's how a lot of things got established today the way they are. So we'll we can explain more in class. You can see me, and we will talk to you later.